All right, so today's June 10th, 2021, and we're going to continue our discussion on the Desiderata Extinctionati. And today we're joined by Max Wilbert. Uh, Max Wilbert is an organizer, writer, and a wilderness guide. He's the author of two books, most recently, Bright Green Lies, How the, Environment, How the Environmental Movement Lost Its Way and What We Can Do About It, with Derek Jensen and Lear Keith. Math is also an essayist whose work has been translated into several languages. He wrote the introduction to the French language translation of the Earth First Direct Action Manual. He has been part of grassroots political work for nearly 20 years, working to defend the planet and in solidarity with indigenous and radical feminist movements. Max is part of a deep green resistance and serves on the board of Fertile Ground Institute for Social and Ecological Justice. He's the editor in chief of the Deep Green Resistance News Service and produces a podcast called The Green Flame. Uh, thank you for joining us today, Max. Glad to be with you. And uh, do you want to go ahead and start uh, with any questions, you that you have? Yeah, I first want to kick off with, uh, I believe you're at Thaka Pass. And so um, I just wanted an update of how it's going there. And it just maybe just in case people don't know, just tell them what's what it's about. Yeah, absolutely. So <clears throat> as I think uh, you all know, and probably most of the listeners know too, many people are putting their faith about solving global warming or addressing the issues of global warming into green technology and green energy, uh, so-called. And, you know, I'm somebody who's fought the fossil fuel industry for a long time now, pretty much a decade. And so it's a, it's a really serious problem. Uh, and we need to stop using fossil fuels as a society, as a world. But, you know, certain people are making plans and, and moving forward with changing the entire economy to simply replace fossil fuels with something else, but keep the structure the same otherwise, right? Keep the economy the same, keep this high consumption, high energy way of life. And that's not going to save the planet. It might reduce carbon a little bit, but it won't solve global warming because it won't uh, reduce the carbon enough. And it, it, it won't stop the destruction of the land and the mass extinction crisis, the biodiversity crisis, uh, you know, ocean acidification, the dead zones in the ocean, uh, you know, this long list of other issues that are all converging and coming together right now. So Thacker Pass, where I am right now, is the site of a proposed lithium mine. And lithium is uh, the, the main ingredient in lithium ion batteries, which power uh, these the cell phones and laptops, but are also a critical ingredient in le electric vehicle batteries and in energy storage batteries uh, to store energy, you know, from solar if the wind uh, the wind isn't blowing, so the wind turbines aren't kicking out power, or it's nighttime, so the solar panels aren't putting out any any energy. Um, battery storage allows you to store that energy and then you know use it when uh, during those time periods, right? And renewable energy is intermittent, right? It's not like oil where you can just burn it whenever you want to and you've got energy. Uh, it's only there when it's there, and so there's this huge increase in demand for lithium and lithium ion batteries, the International Energy Agency is predicting a 30 times increase, 30 fold increase uh, by 2030 in, in lithium, lithium demand. So uh, there's proposed and planned lithium mines all over the world right now. Um, it's sort of exploding as a commodity and there's billions, probably trillions of dollars at stake. And so this Thacker Pass site where I'm at right now is, is the proposed uh, open pit mine that would be the largest lithium mine in the United States. Um, the permitting process for this project was rushed through in less than one year um, in the middle of the coronavirus pandemic uh, under the Trump administration with the, the weakening of environmental regulations that Biden has, has, has not strengthened, um, we should note. <laughs> um, this project was just rushed through, you know, and uh, 
it's it's an incredibly beautiful biodiverse landscape up here at Thacker Pass. It's full of wildlife, uh, water, endangered species. Uh, it's actually sacred land for the indigenous people of this area. Um, it's a very sacred place. And so we, we've been trying to fight and stop this project um, for the past five months. So on January 15th, we set up a protest camp here. At first, it was just me and one other friend of mine. And uh, we endured the winter up here, <laughs> which was pretty wild. But, um, but now we've been here for five months and support has grown. Um, we're hoping that we can stop this project. And um, even though it's June, we're getting a winter storm out here right now. So I'll show you the view out the window of Thacker Pass. Storm clouds and rain today. <laughs> so that's a long-winded answer, but thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. It's good to be here with you all. Yeah, so good to, to speak to you. So who's the mining company that's proposing this? It's a Canadian company called Lithium Americas. They have one other mining project, a lithium mine in Argentina, and they have also been accused of violating indigenous people's rights and destroying the land uh, down there. So there's a pattern here. Are they a public company or are they owned by one of the big mining magnets? Too? They're publicly traded. Uh, they're, I think they're, they're based in British Columbia, Canada, in Vancouver. And so they are traded on the Toronto Stock Exchange and also the New York Stock Exchange. We had the same problem with the same companies um, five times here who rushed through planning permission in South Connemara, where I live, which is a total unspoilt, intact, pristine ecosystem. And mm. uh, they've, been, uh, they've been trying for copper. Mm. And they, for, to that, they would destroy the bog, everything. They would, and they also, I mean, funny enough, it's Canadian again, trying to get the rights of the whole shoreline here for, sea, for seaweed. <laughs> it's just completely out of, you know, but, but metal definitely. Def and the, but, they're at it for 15 years here, but wow. they haven't managed. They haven't managed so far, but they're keeping at it. They're keeping at it. They're keeping at it. It's yeah. all over the world. And it's, it's that, Canada. I mean, why is Canada? My question would be, why is, why is it so? I mean, I, I noticed that when I'm looking up the references um, in your book and, and green, bright, and bright green lies, and when I'm reading other other things about about uh, mining, why is it Canada so that's mentioned so often everywhere? It's a good question. As far as the mining industry, I think Canada has very friendly laws towards that industry, in terms of tax rates or liability or whatever. Um, I don't know the exact details of it, but it's like here in the United States. Most large corporations are incorporated in Delaware, and it's because of these, you know, the tax laws are very favorable to them there. So they can be incorporated or technically headquartered there and basically just have an empty, you know, off, just have a P.O. box or some sort of address. And, you know, all their operations can be somewhere else. But, you know, for legal purposes, they're based there. So, I mean, it's kind of like this new it's this new form of colonialism, you know, a hundred years ago colonialism looked like the East India Trading Company. You know, it was corporate, but it was like based in the state in, in you know, the, the UK. And it was, uh, you know, the British Empire. And it was, it, was, uh, it was like a state projecting its power overseas. And it seems like increasingly we're moving more and more into that corporate dystopia where the states just sort of work to facilitate business and corporate power and the corporations are more the ones that go overseas and do the the dirty work and i mean that's true even of afghanistan right now like biden agreed to pull the 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 most of the u.s military forces out of afghanistan you know ending this 20 year long war but he's not really ending it because it's just private contractors now basically you know they're still leaving some special forces but they can say we're pulling out our army and they are technically, but they're leaving behind all this private military stuff, which is, you know, much harder to regulate and control and is much less transparency and so on. Not that they had much transparency in the first place, but. You've done the know. same in Iraq and Syria. They're, they've left behind yeah. all these private. 
people. Yeah. Yeah. So how um, destructive is mining for lithium salts? Is it is it a really dirty process? I mean, it's an open cast mine, but do they just uh, dynamite it, or you know, get the do they scrape the the soil, or, and then how do they refine it? What what's the process, and how messy is it? Well, there's two main types of lithium mining. Well, three really, but uh, the most popular one. I'll talk about the most popular one and then what's going to happen, happen here. The most popular one is brine, lithium brine. And that's like lithium dissolved in water. And you find a lot of it in these dry lake beds, like underneath a dry lake bed, down in the groundwater underneath it. And so that's why so much lithium mining is in Chile and Argentina, where they have those, uh, you know, the, the Andean Altiplano, where they have all those, the des, you know, it's the Atacama Desert region. They have all these dry lake beds, high elevation. It's actually kind of similar to Nevada because um, we're in the Great Basin here. There's a lot of dry lake beds. You know, it's called the Great Basin because none of the rivers and streams flow to the ocean. They just flow into these basins and then evaporate. And so you get these dry, dry lake beds and lithium gets concentrated through that evaporation process. And so for li brine lithium extraction, they go in and they drill down into the groundwater, they pump it out, and then they basically put it in these gigantic ponds and they just let the sun bake down on it and evaporate the water out. And they end up with this concentrated lithium salt, a lithium rich salt. And then they take that and they refine it further in, in some sort of lab or factory setting. Um, so that's not what's going to be happening here at Thacker Pass. This was an old lake bed, but that was millions of years ago. So there was lithium. There was that type of situation here. But now the lithium is in this clay soil. And so here they're planning to do an open pit mine. So they'll basically just, uh, you know, blow up and bulldoze and scoop out this entire place. It's about 28 square miles I don't know the conversion to kilometers there, maybe 46 square kilometers or something in that ballpark, 50. Um, it's a lot of land. It's a large area. And they'll just basically destroy that whole area. Um, you know, they'll scrape all the life off the topsoil. Um, they'll dig down about almost 400 feet, so a 30-story 30, 30 building down into the ground. Um, I don't know what that is in meters to... 100 and 180 meters or something deep and um, and then they're going to refine it so they'll take what they dig out the lithium in the soil is only about 2,000 parts per million here so to end up with one ton of lithium you need to extract 500 tons of soil so uh, it's not very concentrated they take all the clay and they bring it down to this factory they're planning to build right here on the same site. And then they use a process uh, with huge amounts of sulfuric acid to, uh, you know, basically separate the, out the different minerals in that, uh, in, that, um, in that clay. And so they'll use water. They're going to use 4 million gallons of water a day. Um, that's in liters that's roughly 16 million liters a day um they and then they'll you know still the, my understanding is basically they take the sulfuric acid they take hot water they combine it they put the clay into it and then they just agitate it and shake it up and lithium is a very light element it's the third element on the periodic table so it'll separate out like physically, you know, as that settles, you'll get the heavier sediments will sink to the bottom and the lithium will rise more to the top. And then they can scrape that off and then they'll purify it further using I don't know what methods. Um, but this sulfuric acid process is pretty interesting because uh, sulfuric acid is one of the most important industrial chemicals in use all around the world today. It's very widely used by heavy industry. And almost all of it comes from the oil and gas industry. Um, it's a byproduct of refining oil and gas. Um, you know, they, most countries have set regulations that say, 
you know, gasoline has to have, have low sulfur because of acid rain, right? To keep acid rain in check. Um, and so they, they, they pull the sulfur out of the oil and gas at the refinery. And then they just end up with this giant pile of, of sulfur and they sell it to other, to other uses. So some of that goes to the fertilizer industry um, and some of it goes to, to make sulfuric acid uh, for this type of chemical process. So, uh, you know, what's also interesting too is I'm sure you all are familiar with the tar sands in Canada. Um, tar sands fuels have 11 times as much sulfur in them as conventional heavy crude oil. Um, so, you know, tar sands still make up a big portion of the oil that's refined on this continent. And you've got this huge, you've got literal mountains of sulfur building up at the tar sands. And then they sell that back to other industries. And that's actually a pretty big economic support for the tar sands industry. Um, there have been some studies that have shown that if there wasn't a market for that sulfur, then, uh, you know, the tar sands wouldn't be as profitable as they are today. And the industry would be, would be smaller. It would have to contract. So it's, it's just ironic that, uh, you know, this supposedly green mine, they keep calling it a green mine that's going to save the planet through electric vehicles has this very direct link to, uh, to oil and gas refining. And it's not a small amount of sulfur they're going to bring in. It's thousands of tons per day. If any of you have been to New York City or, you know, you're familiar with the Empire State Building, basically imagine two Empire State Buildings. That's how much sulfur they're going to bring in every single year. And uh, what happens to the runoff? Does it, do they recycle the, the water and the sulfuric acid or does it just drain away? <laughs> well, that depends on who you ask, right? <laughs> the mining company would love uh, for everyone to believe that it will be incredibly clean. There will be no spills or leaks. Um, there will be basically no air pollution coming out of the mine. Um, and that doesn't seem like it's going to be true. Um, so they've got, uh, they've got some different plans in terms of, yeah, recycling the water that they're going to be using. Um, but they're also going to have a giant tailings pond um, for the water. <clears throat> they're going to be digging these pits, basically, where they put the water in there that's all contaminated, and they just let it evaporate. And so then what's left behind is like dust, basically, with all the heavy metals and the uranium and arsenic and other contaminants in that and then they basically just build up a big pile of that and they uh you know bulldoze some other dirt over it and put a big plastic sheet underneath it at the end and then they just leave um that's the plan basically and you know the engineers will tell you oh it's very safe we've got this great plan it's going to be amazing um it basically seems to me like they're, you know, deliberately going to leave a toxic mess behind and, you know, and, and deliberately bury this giant piece of plastic in the soil, which I don't know about where you all are at, but around here, if you throw a plastic bottle outside your window or something, you get a fine, right? You get a ticket, but the mining company, you know, they get a tax break for, uh, for this plan to leave behind a giant toxic dump. Uh, so, you know, it's just the double standard is strong here. So it, it doesn't sound like it's profitable. Is, is it profitable without subsidies or does it require subsidies to for them to actually do this economically speaking? That's a good question. As far as I know, the prices for lithium have been pretty volatile over the last 10 years or so. Um, they've gone really high. They've gone really low. Um, but they're, they're high right now and demand is really high. Um, so, you know, as long as there's a demand, then it may be possible. Um, I think it's kind of, uh, I'm not really sure because I think those market dynamics can change so quickly. Um, but I, you know, they're, they're expecting to make billions of dollars in profits off this mine, um. So that's coming from the company's own projections. You never really know. Um, but either way, if they build it, the land's going to be destroyed, whether or not it's profitable. So 
So, so Elon Musk is. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I just, just wanted to ask a, a so, very short question, but you just say that you've yeah, been yeah. there for several months or several. I, I didn't hear exactly when you've been there. How long? But what is exactly the 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 strategy of of the camp? Um, how are you operating? What what are you doing in terms of actions? Yeah, we've been doing a lot of different things. Um, <clears throat> so, the camp was set up on January fifteenth. So it's been almost five months and sort of the base, the basic foundation of the work is getting the word out, right. And trying to build awareness of these issues. So we're doing a lot of interviews, uh, writing articles, making videos, doing photography, um, trying to, you know, both teach people about the technical side of what's happening here and help people connect, you know, emotionally, you know, more on a human level to, the land to the water to the creatures who live here um i really think that's a big part of the change that we need to see in the world is we need to shift our allegiance from machines to the land itself you know and whenever we're asked to make a choice between the living planet and the economy or machines or products we need to choose the land every single time right? We need to choose the land. And that's, that is a value judgment, essentially, you know, it, it reflects your values. You can, a lot of people like to talk about like the um, ecosystem services and trying to quantify the value of nature by putting a dollar value on it and that type of stuff. And I'm pretty wary of those approaches um, because what if you do the math and the, 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 the numbers say that it's worth it to destroy this place, right? Does that mean it's okay? Like there's no, and to me, there's just no, there's no way to put a value on whether or not the people who live here in 300 years will have drinking water or not. You know, I mean, literally you could give those people all the money in the world, but if they can't drink the water, they'd say, no, I don't want the money. I want water. Right. Um, so, uh, so that's part of it is that sort of education, spreading the word and so on. Part of it is lawsuits. Um, we're not doing these directly, but there are two lawsuits that have been filed against this project. The environmental laws are not very strong in the United States, um, but this project was very poorly done. And in my opinion, it has violated the existing weak environmental laws that we do have. Um, the, the third sort of prong of the strategy is being led by the native communities from the, especially people from the, uh, Fort McDermott Paiute Shoshone reservation. That's the indigenous people whose land this is, uh, this is their ancestral territory. Um, it's very central part of their territory. There's artifacts all over the place here. There's something like a thousand um, archaeological sites right here in Thacker Pass. Um, it's a sacred place. There's oral histories about this place and the history of it. Um, a massacre took place here um, when the when the uh, the U.S. when the United States was colonizing this area. Some of the families, the ancestors of these these indigenous people, they would hide. They hid up in Thacker Pass to escape from the cav the army, you know, that was sent to hunt them down. Um, so there's this long, long history of people living here and not destroying it, <laughs> you know, and living in balance with the land here. And so uh, there's a lot of strong opposition coming out of the native community here. Um, a group called the people of red mountain has come together to oppose this mine. And it's not just this mine. There's another lithium mine that's proposed for, um, about 50 kilometers north of here. And between here and there, that whole distance of 50 kilometers, there's lithium mining claims throughout that whole area. So the industry wants to turn this whole thing into a sacrifice zone and extraction zone. Um, and, you know, that's, that's still where people, uh, the native people here, they, a lot of them still hunt. Um, they still gather their traditional medicines, um, some of their first foods, right? I mean, they're, they're modern people living in the modern world, but
but a lot of the people, especially elders still have a connection to their traditions and their heritage and, you know, the way that they have lived for thousands of years on this land. Um, so the approach with them is they have some special protections under U S law. Um, there's like, uh, there's some laws about, uh, consulting with, uh, native tribes when you're going to do a project that might impact their traditional lands. Um, there, there are various, uh, things around that. So, um, we've been trying to work at, as allies with the native people around here and support their efforts and amplify their voices, um, to slow down and create as much pressure and opposition as possible to the mining company and the government. Um, so, and then, um, the, the next strategy is sort of the direct action strategy, which, you know, the camp itself right here, we're on, we're, we're set up right in the middle of the proposed open pit mine. So, um, it's legal for us to camp here. We're allowed to camp here for now. Um, but we don't intend to leave until this project is fought off. Right. And so if they try and come in and destroy this place, we're going to try and stop them and we'll see what that looks like. We don't really know um, how that will play out in the coming months. Um, but we're trying to be here as a, you know, visual something uh, as a visual and physical focal point for the opposition um, to bring people out to this place and have them see the land and see what's at stake. So it's not just an abstract mental debate that's taking place on the internet and, you know, in offices, in government offices, but we're keeping the focus on the land here and what's actually at stake. Um, so those are the main strategies that we're, that we're working with. Thank you. Yeah. Have you got any, um, like local law enforcement or is, is there any kind of, you know, direct opposition to you on the ground there or are you left alone so far? A little bit of both. Um, <clears throat> we haven't faced, you know, we haven't faced like brutal repression so far, but we're expecting that the repression will escalate at any time. Um, thus far, you know, the BL, the Bureau of Land Management is the federal agency that's responsible for this land. Um, this land was never given to the United States in a treaty. Um, so it's unceded territory of the native people. Um, basically, the U.S. government claims it by right of conquest. Um, so they say this is federal land. <laughs> and, um, and the law enforcement rangers have come up here. They're definitely keeping an eye on what we're doing. They're watching the situation. Um, mostly they've just been gathering information so far. But that's, you know, that's always step one. And then they'll escalate from there. Um, so, um, you know, we're working to push back in, in various different ways. If they do try and come out and, and clear us out of this camp, um, we have some different plans for how we will push back against that. Um, but we'll see, it kind of depends on how things play out. So if the U S claims it by right of conquest, surely that implies that uh, you have the right to claim it back from the U S by <laughs> conquest as well. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I uh, mean, surely it goes both ways. Doesn't it? I mean, come on. I mean, yeah. we're all in the conquest business, aren't we? We should, yeah. we should just come there's, back. There's actually a U.S. Supreme court case that goes back. Um, I don't know when this case was, it might've been might have been in the 1950s. It might have been even earlier than that, where a, a native uh, person or tribe challenged, challenged the U.S. government. And the Supreme Court actually said, uh, basically, this land is, is ours by right of conquest. I wish I had the direct quote on me right now, because when you read it, it's pretty stunning. And it's basically just saying, you know, this is ours now. We took it. And the courts will not consider anything else. Um, and, you know, that's, I mean, that's the basis of this entire country. That's what this country was built on is stolen land. Um, so it's, it's, of course, it's morally indefensible. Um, there is the reality that there are 350 million people here now. <laughs> and, 
you know, so what do you do about that? That's a challenging question. Um, but, you know, I think that um, even in the short term, if we want to talk about justice, if we want to talk about sustainability, we really need to be moving to give more, you know, not give, but uh, return more and more land to to the tribes and the, the native nations. Um, and, you know, that that would be a step in the right direction. Yeah, it seems so morally and legally fraught. Um, but are they claiming like um, imminent domain? I mean, if, if they have burial sites there, aren't there some protections in the law for a burial site or can they claim imminent domain of a burial site? Yeah, so there's a law called the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, uh, NAGPRA. And it, it's not as strong of a law as you would wish. <laughs> um, it's sort of like in this country, we have the National Environmental Policy Act. And that law doesn't say that you can't destroy the land. It just says that you have to be honest about what you're doing. Basically, you have to write an environmental impact study and just disclose all the impacts that you're going to make. And you have to consider alternatives, right? You have to consider not, not destroying the place. But there's no obligation to not destroy whatever or log old growth forest or poison rivers or whatever. Um, and it's the same with the NAGPRA law. It basically says the federal government has to consult with the tribes um, around uh, graves and cultural sites. Um, but it doesn't say what that consultation has to look like. It doesn't say that if the tribes say, no, you can't do it. <laughs> um it should say that it should say if the tribes say no, you can't do it. Right. Um, but it doesn't say that the, I think that that putting that type of power in the hands of the tribes scares the federal government for good reason. Um, because there are graves and sacred sites all over this continent, literally all over the place. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, so it, it should scare them, um, because they're, they're destroying sacred sites and burial sites all the time when they build highways and shopping malls and, you know, oil and gas pipelines and, and all kinds of different things. Um, but yeah, it's, it's not that strong of a law, but, you know, we're trying to use the tools that we have, knowing that they probably won't be enough. But sometimes if you slow things down enough, if you push back hard enough, you build public pressure and, excuse me, and opposition then um, then you can get political victories, right? Yeah, I, um, nobody's talking about compensation or anything. They haven't discussed that kind of thing, trying to you know, just make a, some kind of agreement to, to get the, the mind going and just compensate people. They're, just, they're not even considering that. Yeah, they, they tried to do that. So uh, the mining company came into this area um, a couple years ago, and they met with the tribal council at that time at Fort McDermott, the tribal government, and they created an agreement with them to collaborate, basically. Um, so they would give some jobs and training and I don't know what else to the tribe, and in return, the tribe would support the mine. Um, that, that tribal government is now gone. They're out of power. And the new tribal government canceled that agreement and uh, rejected it, um, you know, after seeing the strength of the opposition within their community, um, they decided to cancel it. So the mining, but the mining company is doing something similar with the, uh, the non-native community down here, the, the mostly white uh, farming and ranching community. They, um, they hired this facilitation group to come in and negotiate with them and try to come to agreement. So they're trying to uh, buy a new school for that community. Um, they're basically trying to, to bribe them. Um, and, you know, they're trying to, they're really trying to put it out there and make people feel powerless. They're really trying to make people feel like this is coming in, whether you like it or not. And so you might as well get a new school out of it, right? You might as well get such and such. Um, it's a very sneaky, abusive tactic 
And even if you understand that they're using that tactic against you, it can be effective, right? If you really feel it. can be very effective. It can be very effective because in in a previous fight in, in my country, in North Mayo on the West Coast here, Shell did the same thing to try to get a pipeline going through a, a, a protected area with a very, very uh, small community. And there was a fight of years and years, and it ended with this, with bribing and money, and it split the community. And and they managed, they managed that way to completely end up the resistance because they separated people. And it was based on exactly what yep, you said. Absolutely. Yeah, and, you know, this is something that these companies always do. They try and get, they're going to try and separate people, you know, and they're going to try and separate out the different groups and who's willing to compromise and who's hardline and who's, uh, you know, idealistic and who's in the middle and who's on the fence. And they're going to try and work with each group separately and address them using different tactics. Um, so it's really important with these type of projects that people stick together. Um, and that's hard, <laughs> but, uh, you know, as much as possible, the more you're able to present a, a united front, um, the better. I think, you know, I think it's not that it works. Unfortunately here, what worked, um, in, in a lot of little areas, it was, it was individual actions and, uh, and, uh, targeted, uh, isolated, non-organized actions that paralyzed, uh, the big companies much more than trying to create, um, uh, a unified front, which is completely idealistic and mm. productive, and it's just an utopia. Um, yeah, I think I think you're certainly right to some extent, and I think in a lot of cases it won't be possible to create that kind of united front. Um, it is possible in some cases, like two examples here would be a water pipeline in eastern Nevada and a pipeline fight in southern Oregon. Um, those were both won through like sort of broad coalitions with people from different political perspectives, um, you know, all sort of working in parallel. Um, and I think as, as much as possible, it's, it's good and it's important to try and organize and build alliances with other people. Um, but it's important that you not compromise when you do that, I think. Um, you know, I think if, if you can do that without compromising, then it's a great idea. If you need to compromise to do that, then you need to rethink. Um, you know, that I don't think compromise is always bad, but it's mostly bad. <laughs> you know, most compromises end up really hurting what you're trying to do and compromise, you know. Um, but yeah, I definitely hear what you're saying. And I think there are a lot of situations in which, um, you know, small groups or even individuals can be really effective. Um, you know, and one of the things that we're trying to do here is is both fight this project and um, this is a symbolic project, right? This is representative of the whole issue that we're facing with this green energy transition. And we're trying to force a reckoning with that as a society. You know, the world has started a little bit to reckon with fossil fuels and the harm they cause. Um, not enough, not nearly enough, but has just barely started to scratch the surface of that. And with that door cracking open, there's an opportunity there to question and interrogate not just fossil fuels, but our whole way of life, our whole economy, um, our whole culture. And uh, that's what we're trying to do here is sort of extend that questioning further. And, you know, I don't I don't really think that changing the narrative is a big victory. <laughs> um, I think we need material victories. We need change in how things are actually working um and too often we get content with like we got media coverage yay <laughs> you know um which is not is not what we need we don't need more media coverage we need to stop the murder of the planet and um and i think in many cases that's going to require serious direct action um and it's going to require like minorities of people who are doing things that are very unpopular. Um, but at the same time, I think that's very true. And I think we need to be building to make those things popular, right? And change and, 
You know, we can't just leave those people isolated on the fringes of society doing small actions because it won't be enough if it's just 10 or 100 or 1,000 of us doing those type of things. We need to build that. And I always try and say, like, radicals are used to being isolated and put on the fringes of society. And we need to reclaim the center because, you know, who's the real radicals, you know, not not radical in the sense of getting to the root of the problems, but radical in the sense of of crazy (laughs) and extreme. The real radicals are the fossil fuel companies and the lithium mining companies and the politicians and even the bright green activists who are saying we can save the world through electric cars. Those are the extreme people. Those are the crazy people who are not grappling with reality. And I'm not going to be content with being on the fringes of society, uh, you know, just speaking my truth to a small, tiny group of people. I think we need to claim the center and push those people out and say the truth, right? And speak the truth and, and make the changes that need to be made, you know, not in a compromising sense, not in the sense of like, I want to become president or something like that, you know? not in the sense of claiming the center like that, but claiming the center sort of morally and ethically and in a broader like cultural sense, you know, Um, we really have the moral high ground um, and the information that's necessary. And, you know, those people who aren't willing to grapple with the information, they're acting like spoiled children, basically. And we need to be the adults in the room and, you know, be the ones who are real about what's going on and what needs to change. So, um, I don't know if you know, but it's a kind of red letter day. The the Keystone XL pipeline is dead, officially. So that that was at least a victory for conventional tactics. I think just conventional environmental opposition without radical action. Yeah, I think to some extent, but. Um... You know, while everyone was so busy fighting Keystone XL, they expanded uh, oil transport by rail, right? So everyone was focused on the pipeline. Meanwhile, um, well, the the oil companies had to get their oil out somehow. And so Warren Buffett, that savior of the environment, right, Um, who builds wind turbines and and so on, he... uh, he he, he presided over a huge expansion in oil by rail transport, you know, inter- and at a scale like a capacity that's larger than the Keystone XL pipeline would have been. So, you know, that's what's dangerous about these single campaign fights, um, focusing on one fight. Like even I'm recognizing that here at Thacker Pass, there's proposed lithium mines in Oregon, in Arizona, um, all over the world, right, in North Carolina, in, and by putting focus solely on this place, I worry that we lose track of the broader issues. It's sort of like whack-a-mole, right, that game where the critters are popping up everywhere, and you keep whacking one and whacking another, and the other thing I worry about is that this is just a new mine, and same with Keystone XL, that's just a new pipeline. What about all the pipelines that are already in the ground pumping away? Nobody seems to be fighting those um, and trying to get those shut down. And so I just, I, I worry um, that, you know, and I think a lot of people are aware of this, but, um, but that's just one of the dangers of focusing on one particular project when we really need this huge systemic change, um, you know, broad economic change. And what appears to be a victory like Keystone XL Sure, it's good to celebrate. I mean, I know a lot of people who are involved in fighting that. and But I think that that's mostly a symbolic victory more than a really tangible victory for the planet. So since all the guys who are actually, you know, laying the, the pipelines and are planning to do mines at Packer Pass and things like that, are, are they just doing a cost-benefit analysis and they reckon that they come out $2 billion ahead, is it worth analyzing exactly the finances of what goes in it and with the view to actually making it unprofitable? So if you think in terms of, I bet you they couldn't, for example, get insurance against acts of terrorism, 
in which case if they got acts of terrorism they would be they wouldn't be able to insure themselves in which case they couldn't go ahead with the project and that kind of thing or or for example just going after the water just just maybe securing you know getting a, a gofundme to buy their water supply and then sell them you know at a million bucks a liter or something like that and uh, you know going at different angles to think of you know the inputs that they're going to need and look at from their balance sheet because i mean as I've, I've been in business for a while and if you look at a balance sheet or a spreadsheet on any one of these projects there's always something narrow there's always some little detail that you barely scrape through on right and if you just raise the profit say of labor of risk of uh, resources any one of those things that they could be badly trapped you know there, there's always something that you know five cents more and the whole project <laughs> falls apart if you can actually analyze it and find that you'll find that so say for example it could be tiny it could be just the transportation they might find that you know if you bought up all the local trucking uh, maybe there's trucking regulations that only certain number of unions allowed to truck or something you go to those unions and you basically say that they wouldn't be able to to truck stuff out or in or so you know that that kind of thing do you think it's worth taking their viewpoint which is the financial one because our viewpoint is always saving the environment and we don't yeah. look at it from the psychopath's point of view which is just making a buck cost benefit yeah. analysis yeah absolutely and um i think i think that's totally worthwhile um and i think you know we could use some more people with economics backgrounds with backgrounds in the mining industry to help with that kind of thing um finance backgrounds um that's definitely very helpful. We just released actually um, last week a letter to the investors. Basically, we're, we're alleging that, um, that the company is misleading investors by not fully disclosing the risks that face this project. Um, and that would be a violation of securities laws. And, um, you know, and we're basically just trying to, 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 to put that information out there. And we're not, you know, we're not trying to, um, to lie. We're just putting out factual information about the risks that face this project. And the law is that as a company, you have to disclose risks to your shareholders. And, you know, if you don't, then that's, that's a violation. Um, so we have to be kind of careful about that stuff because, you know, there's, there's laws in this country about, you know, manipulating the stock market and so on. We don't want to fall foul of those. Um, so we're just trying to tell the truth, just say factual d data. Um, well, but yeah, I think, yeah, I, mean, I think it's, I think it's worthwhile those things that you're talking about. And, you know, as far as like you talked about eco terrorism and, and that type of thing, you know, I've, I've for years been saying that it's going to take very serious, highly illegal types of actions to stop these industries from destroying the planet. And, you know, that's a dangerous thing to say. It's not a popular thing to say, but I think it's the reality. Um, and I think we're increasingly seeing more people rec recognize that. Um, you know, there's this new uh, fiction book that just came out, The Ministry for the Future, um, a sci-fi author named Kim Stanley Robinson, who's pretty, pretty well known. And in that book, he, he, it's a climate fiction book, right? So it starts in 2025. And it starts with a massive heat wave hitting India and it hits the wet bulb temperature and 20 million people die. Right. And in the wake of this, in his fictional world, um, these underground resistance groups emerge in India and they start assassinating fossil fuel industry CEOs and using drones to blow up oil refineries. And, you know, they're saying, look, you, this industry is murdering people. You know, and it may not be shooting a bullet directly and killing them, but this industry is responsible for killing 20 million people. And that's not that part is not fiction. That's reality. Right. Um, so it's the same with the chemical industry, you know, the cancers, the diseases that they pump out. They are killing people. They might as well be putting a gun to people's head and shooting them. In many cases, it's even worse, though, because people are dying these horrible lingering deaths that are incredibly painful, not just a quick quick bullet to the head um and you know it's it's really important that we all recognize the seriousness of these issues i mean you read the climate reports that are talking about a hundred million climate refugees by the end of the century 
I mean, Europe is like staggering right now under the load of, you know, one or two million refugees from Syria, right? Imagine a hundred million, you know, and the strain that that causes on societies and the chaos and the trauma and the, the pain. And, you know, there's people, you're in Greece, you said, and, the, you know, there's people drowning in the ocean right now trying to escape from Africa to Europe because of the legacy of colonialism and poverty and ecological destruction and all the, you know, corporate devastation that's been wrought on Africa, you know, to enrich the, the wealthiest in the world. Um, you know, there's, there's people dying every single day um, because of the global economic system, because of the way we live. And that's only going to get worse from here on out. And so, you know, I think there's a very strong ethical and moral case to be to be made for, um, you know, uh, serious actions against the global industrial economy, the fossil fuel industry and so on um, as a form of self-defense, collective self-defense. Yeah, so one thing, one thing I've uh, thought about in the past and actually, you know, posted a few things on Reddit about it is uh, if you... All these substances or uh, materials, all these resources, like lithium and CO2, everybody assumes that they're benign. Um, and they don't actually do, um, you know, basically a lethality index. So any, any hazardous substance uh, commercially available has a lethality index. And it says, you know, how many people it'll kill in, some, in such quantity. But nobody seems to do it for things like CO2 and lithium. You think it's worthwhile just saying like, okay, I, I did a thing showing, you know, rough calculation. You can say, look, if we get to 500 parts per million, probably billions of people die off. So then you can work out what tonnage right. of CO2 emitted into the atmosphere. So you say every ton of CO2 you emitting into the atmosphere, I did a rough calculation, about 13 people are going to die. Yeah. So, no, so, you know, so then you can say every time an aircraft takes off, they're burning enough fuel to kill three people. Yeah, you can do an ethical and maybe a legal uh, justification for taking radical action against those people by putting the you know it, it's always like okay you're the radical because you're stopping a plane flying and you say no that plane is killing people I'm not yep. being radical by keeping it yep. on the ground yeah and so trying ch to ch change the fo focus saying these are lethal substances so you go through the entire thing of the process of actually mining lithium. At some stage, I bet they have to melt it down, in which case there's CO2 emitted. And you say, oh, yeah. you know, lithium has a, a, a lethality index of maybe one person a ton. So if you're hauling one, per, you know, if you're mining one ton of lithium, I have the moral justification to shoot you. Do, mm. do you see what I mean? You, you can yeah. make a legal and ethical case that way. I, I would love to see those numbers for those calculations that you've done. I think that type of um, moral uh, reasoning is so incredibly important right now, um, you know, for people to really recognize and feel what's at stake. And, um, you know, I think you could do the same type of rough, you know, ballpark calculation in terms of species extinction. You know, you could say, you know, for every, uh, for every so-and-so mines that we that we create or that industry makes this many species are going to be driven extinct or you know for this many tons of co2 this many species are going to be driven extinct obviously that's a very rough you know estimate but uh but it's important to have that type of comparison and yeah, but, um, sorry but does that the, the aim of doing the lethality index is 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 um is very interesting for us we we are convinced of that we know it and we but okay you might rise awareness which i hate to say that word and we might just but but those people the system doesn't the system has been running with accepting a lethality index all the time with wars accepting that millions of people were died in the trenches of 1916 and they accept they've accepted world war ii they've accepted so this it's very good to do this lethality index but it's it's not going to have any effect on people who are already bent on it being lethal and as you said are psychopaths well, I mean, maybe maybe not but the, the thing is they get away with it i mean everything like even the jabs now they have a lethality index they just say well the benefits outweigh the risk but 
you're in a really difficult situation to say like, okay, the benefits of lithium outweigh the risks. There are no benefits of lithium. To, right. it's, to say that it's keeping CO2 in the ground is, is, is nonsense. It's not. It's, it's basically just, as you say, it's, it's making profit. So if you say there's a $2 billion profit, you can say, well, uh, courts routinely uh, have a cost of life estimate. So if you say, you know, n number of people will die because this uh, is released into the environment, therefore you owe that much in compensation to the American people or the world or something, and you say you, you better put that in escrow before you start mining. Right. The, the you know, thing, there's so go there, there have been some articles that have said, you know, if you fully um, rationalize the externalities of industry today, if you incorporate all the externalized costs, no, no sector of the industrial economy would be profitable, right? And that's, that's a good thing in my perspective. I mean, it's, it's, good to, it's good to show that and to pull those numbers forward and to show people because, you know, this way of life isn't even making us happy. Like modern industrial high energy consumption way of life, like more people are depressed than ever. More people are sick and disconnected and traumatized and you know just going through the motions every day um and it's crazy i mean we live in really like if you really think about it like we sort of live in a death cult that's what the economy is it's a death cult it's creating these products and these sort of very superficial experiences but it doesn't represent a wise or intelligent way to live in any sense you know it doesn't represent um, a full expression of what it means to be a human being, you know, to explore questions of, of life and death and spirituality and love and connection and family and these type of things like those play no major role in our society for the most part, right? It's all about the money and it, and we are all trapped in that system. And so but, you know, but... to, to respond to what you were saying, Sophie, I think, um, you're absolutely right that those numbers won't convince the people in power to change. But I think what those numbers help us do is build movement and build opposition um, because there's so much propaganda and there's so much brainwashing that teaches people, you know, it's all about the jobs. It's all about your 401k. It's all about um, economic growth. And, uh, you know, the nation is in trouble. Our economic growth is slowed down, you know, <laughs> Um, we hear that type of thing all the time. And we need people to understand that when the economy shrinks, that's a good thing. And yes, it creates some hardship because of the way we live. But that means we need to change the way we live, not that we need more economic growth. And, you know, the other thing I wanted to throw out there was um, this lithium mine will release hundred more than 152,000 tons of carbon dioxide equivalent per year. And producing a single electric car produces nine tons of CO2, approximately. So, uh, you know, over the lifetime of this mine, which is 46 years, I think you're talking about something like 8 million tons of carbon dioxide emissions just from this mine itself. Um, that doesn't include downstream processing and building the electric cars and so on. Um, so what was the number? You said each ton is 13 people. Yeah, it's, I, mean, I mean, I just a, a back of the envelope cal calculation. But if you say how much, you know, we're at 420 parts per million CO2 right. in the upper atmosphere. If we get to 500, then there are lots of estimates for how many people will die. But there's a good chance all 8 billion people die. You, you, could, you could always take it to say if we get to 550, everyone dies. Mm -hmm. And then basically you say, okay, well, how many, how many tons of CO2 is that? And work backwards to uh, the cost per a life per ton, and I think that's that's quite reasonable because that's exactly how hazardous substances are worked out. It's they say you know if you release a ton of this into the atmosphere, there's how many people are going to die, and then point zero right. zero one. Well, but but I mean in the case of CO two, it's it could be eight billion people. So yeah, yeah, yeah but, and you know this is just real quick. I'll say you know I I used to be one of those people who you know, basically thought everyone was stupid for not understanding this. <laughs> and I don't really think that anymore. I think most people, I think they're not, maybe not most, 
there are a lot of intelligent people in the world, right? I think most people make rash, relatively rational decisions about their lives. I think most people feel pretty powerless um, and don't really feel like they have any say in the society they live in. Um, we live in these sort of illus illusory democracies in so many ways. And, and yet I think that I have some faith in the inherent goodness of human beings. I don't think we're inherently bad people. I think there are sociopaths out there. Some are born, some are made um, through abuse and culture and whatever. Um, and we have to be very wary of those people. But I think I have some, you know, despite everything, it's kind of <laughs> despite everything, I still have some faith in human beings. I mean, you three are an example of that to me. Because, you know, your you're people, we're living in this society. There are so many things pulling us in different directions and making us crazy and teaching us that money is everything and worship the dollar. And, and yet people get through it and come to the truth. And I think that, you know, the re one of the reasons they spend trillions of dollars on advertising and mass media and all these things is because it takes a lot of effort to keep people deceived. <laughs> It takes a lot of effort to keep people from, you know, uh, becoming more fully human beings. And, um, you know, so that's one of the things that I always try and point back to is, is that reality itself is on our side, you know, that the truth will out <laughs> and we need to be the allies of that truth, you know, speaking it, pushing it forward. And, you know, I think that, um, I don't know what the future holds. It, it might be, it's likely to be pretty bad regardless of what we do. But I think we have control over, we have some degree of control over how bad it's going to get. Um, and I think that, um, you know, there's still, there's still latitude, there's still wiggle room. And we need to be working to aim for the best case scenarios that, that we can get. Yeah, I, th right. I think... Um, it's, uh, you, you have to go soon. No, but, no. Um, oh, okay. So, um, yeah, I, I think it's not just bright green lies. I think we are all living a lie and the, the lie is exposed if we did a proper accounting, because just like you said in bright green lies is that I fundamentally agree that we, the foundational myth of our culture is that there is a benefit to civilization. Civilization actually yields dividends. And it's not. It's just false accounting. When you account for everything and the future generations, the lives that you've cost in terms of the labor, the, how people shortchange today, um, and, and uh, basically the can kick down the road for future generations, if you do a whole cost accounting, it turns out to be a bust. It turns out to be a net, uh, basically bankrupt. But the same applies to something like Thacker Pass. If you force them to do an entire whole cost accounting, you, you show in microcosm the bankruptcy of our entire civilization project. Because, it, for example, like Elon Musk keeps on saying, oh, you know, you've got to mine lithium like there's no tomorrow, but we're going to be clean mines, and then basically they're going to actually, uh, you know, restore the land afterwards. And... As you know, that's hokum because if you really paid the cost of restoration, so you've got 46 years, 2 billion total or 2 billion a year that they're making profit? Uh, I think it's more than 2 billion. I think that they're wet. I'm not sure off the top of my head of the exact number. It's somewhere between 1.5 and, and 4 billion in profits that they're talking about. Total over 46 years? I believe so. It may be. Well, I'm it, not sure. Just maybe that's, maybe the economic annual. case for this is, is Boulder Dash. Yeah, you, maybe, you, that, you can, maybe that is. You can annual, prove to the sure. shareholders that, this, that they, 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 they're just doing an enterprise that only works because you have subsidies, because you don't actually restore the land, because you haven't actually uh, compensated everybody that's going to be injured by this. You can easily build the business case that's just like their business case that says, hey, this is a wonderful prospectus come and invest, you can easily say that this is a lie and they've been basically defrauding uh, the shareholders and the stakeholders because they are doing false accounting. 
you can say that all of these things have been left out and take them to court. Do it, do, as a shareholder, you can buy one share and do a shareholder action against them. So, I mean, I think that's the way to go is there's like play their game because their game, as you say, is a lie. And the lie is this idea of surplus. There is no surplus in all of this. They've been pulling the wool over our eyes, pretending that there's a surplus so that they can take a profit. But uh, we're paying. <laughs> it's a whole cost accounting. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's really important. And, and um, you know, I think that any time that we use their tools and their mindsets, I think it's worth doing in some cases, but we also have to be careful with it. You know, like I was saying earlier, if you do the math and it shows that it is economically good to destroy this place, you know, obviously that takes, like you were just saying, that takes fudging the math, but they're going to, we know they're going to keep doing that. And the law is going to allow them to keep doing that, you know, unless it's changed in some pretty fundamental ways. And, um, so we just have to be, we have to be a little bit wary. And that's why, you know, recently the CEO of this company wrote a letter to the editor in a local newspaper. And he was basically saying this project will create this many jobs and uh, it's a very green project. We're contributing to the new green economy. Um, you know, we're going to be a good member of the community. We're going to be very nice to everyone. <laughs> Uh, you know, the usual hogwash. and Yeah, but it, my, there's no dollar value on it. It's all soft, isn't it? Yeah, and my, I mean, my response to that was that, you know, I can talk about the numbers and why the numbers are wrong. And I did in that, in my response piece, I said, here's, here's the numbers that they're not telling you. Here's the ways that they're deceiving you with these statistics. But I also said, you know, fundamentally, this, this conflict isn't about numbers. This conflict is about values. And what it really comes down to is that, you know, me and the other people who are working here value this place and value the non-human life that lives here and value the water and the, the soil and the insects and the wildflowers and the sacred site and, you know, value, uh, value and perceive, perceive and value that we are fully dependent on a living planet for our survival. Every sip of water, every bite of food, every breath of air we take comes from a living planet and is created by, you know, this community of, of non-human life that we're a part of. And, you know, if you don't perceive that as, as having value, if that's not your, your worldview, then it's going to be, it's going to make rational sense to you to destroy a place like this. And so fundamentally, it's not really a clash of numbers, although the numbers are important and, and should be important and we can and should, you know, stand our ground and fight back on the number side. But fundamentally, it's a clash of worldviews and a clash of values. And, you know, like I was saying earlier, they're the extreme ones. They're the crazy ones. Like literally, if you talk about being out of touch with physical reality, if that's what it means to be crazy is that you're out of touch with physical reality, then they are crazy. Literally, they are crazy because they don't understand that you can't destroy the planet and continue living or have future generations. I mean, if you were, imagine you were living in a village, you know, 400 years ago somewhere and a member of your community comes along and starts digging giant holes in the ground and poisoning the water and killing all the fish and cutting down the trees that you all depend on for your lives every day, you would say that person is crazy, <laughs> right? You would literally say that person is crazy. What the hell are they doing? <laughs> you know, but only they, now those people are, are running the economy. But, yeah. but they are crazy. Yeah, but here's the thing I, that troubles me is Bright Green Lies was a book from the heart. And now you're speaking from the heart. And I think this is a flaw because we know exactly what you're saying and normal people speak from the heart. They're psychopaths. Mm -hmm. They only do guns and money. They only do numbers. And I think we should forget about the heart. We all know what we're fighting for, but it's, it's no point bringing about, you know, you can't bringing up a matter of the heart to a psychopath is actually saying I'm weak, go and maul me. 
And mm. we should just say, okay, it's our secret that we're doing this for, you know, basically different uh, world uh, worldview and a different value system. But we, we have to take it on their value system. And their value system is money, guns, and numbers. And they mm. fall down. Their, their weak point is that their, their, their numbers, the thing they value most, don't come out. So that, that's their weak point. So we should forget about the heart of the thing because they, they have no heart. So they just calculating machines and they have a flaw in their program that basically their sums don't come out. So we should attack it there, right there on the fact that we have to raise the costs. Everything must raise the cost. We must do everything we can. So, you know, it, it's like Naomi Klein and you're talking about in Bright Green Lives is that the polar bears don't do it for me. We, we, people like us have to forget a bit about the heart because the, everybody is like Naomi Klein. These people are hostage to the system. They're hostage to their cell phones and the internet and this tech society and the machines. They they captured by it. And so we have to forget the thing at the heart and just say that they set the terms of engagement for psychopaths and their terms of engagement are the figures. And so you just say, okay, we just drive up the costs every way we can. We look at their figures because they're lying. Their figures lie. So they're lying to themselves. And the way to expose the lie is in their language, which is numbers. Mm -hmm. And so That's basically right. you go to, you just, just right. keep Seven on days. driving up the costs, driving up the costs so that they yeah. have to say that they're bankrupt. They cannot That's do right. these things because the cost benefit is just not there. But that's why what you were saying in previous meetings, uh, Hugh, is that's why sabotage works so well. That's why uh, making them waste time and money works so well, because that's they understand that, because that's their mm -hmm. sensitivity. That's their heart. Um, yeah. Well, you, know. well, you see, that's that's the whole thing. Is It's like the reason why they don't want us, want us to go for the kryptonite is because of the cost benefit, the cost, the, the cost to the resistance is so fucking cheap it's just pennies and the cost of them is millions yeah. so that's why they hate the kryptonite because it's, it's basically the cost benefit analysis just throws their game out of the out of the water but yep. isn't that yeah. the way we must look at it we must get activists to stop doing all these useless things that cost time and energy. you know banner drops and stuff like that if you look at the time spent of the the you know just if you just look at the labor our costs of doing a banner drop for the for the benefit, which is zero. You say, well, well, if you did a bit of monkey wrenching, what's the cost benefit? It's a few pennies. If you get caught, maybe it's six years, you would factor that in as a risk factor, but you can actually factor the risk and factor the cost benefit and say, yeah, this is the, the kryptonite is the cheapest form of increasing their costs, right? Yeah, I think there's a lot to that. And, and I think I, I I agree in one sense, which is that when you're dealing with the company and the people in power, I think you're right that you have to speak their language. You're not, you can't go in there, you know, and lay your heart open to them and, and say, this is why what you're doing is wrong and you should be living in a different way. And I love the land and so on. They're just going to be like, get out of here, you stupid hippie. Right. <laughs> um, they're going to just insult you and think you're an idiot. Um, and you can't go in like that. I think we have to treat this like what it is, which is a fight. It's a war. And so when we're facing the enemy, we need to have our serious face on, right? And we need to take actions that aren't about convincing our enemy that what they're doing is wrong, but are about stopping them from doing what they want to do, right? Making it impossible for them to continue, physically impossible for them to continue, which can be done you know, using monkey wrenching, using economic means, using all kinds of different means, right? Um, and I think that, I think where the heart side comes in is for our own people, is for the people who are sympathetic, but are on the sidelines, you know, because I think that, you know, you think about the decision, how, how scary it is, how dangerous it is, how different it feels to go from everyday life, watching TV, growing up in this culture, and to consider taking this type of very serious action to defend the planet, to defend future generations, to defend our own lives, you know, our own communities, that's a very hard thing to do. And I think that is an emotional process of helping people move from, you know, a basic understanding of the issues to taking risks and taking serious action. 
I think that's, that's primarily an emotional process. Information is a big part of it, but I think, I think that's where it comes in. Like when we're facing our enemies, we have our game face on, but when we're facing the other direction and we're talking to our communities and people who might be sympathetic or who we're trying to get on board, I think we need to have the numbers. We need to have the rational side, the science, um, the information, but it's also really important that we need to have the heart in it too. Because, you know, anyone who has kids, anyone who has a family, you know, um, imagine you're walking down the street with your mom, right? And somebody comes up and just slaps her in the face randomly. You know, what are you going to do? You, you, most of us, we wouldn't even think about it. We would jump in between the two people. Maybe we'd cock back our fist and just smack that person as hard as we could, right? It's not, it, that's not, a, that's not a, a thinking process. It's not a mental process. That's an, that's an emotional connection. It's that love. It's that sense of love and protectiveness. And I think that's something that we need to develop more because rationally, it's all too easy to come up with reasons not to act. You know, it's scary. You talked about the six years in jail. You talked about, there's all the, I know I could lose my job. Somebody will get mad at me. I might go to jail. Um, there's all these rational reasons to not take action. Um, but if you love, if you love, then it's not, that's not what it's about. If you love, then you defend that which you love. You defend those who you love. And its consequences don't matter, right? Because that's yeah, not I th- important. I mean, I think the rationalizing is a bourgeois thing in the, you know, the middle class that is far too privileged. Yeah. And they don't think that there is a real emergency. But... Yeah. Um, I question this thing about the heart and and going over too much about the heart because we all we all know what the the case is and the reason that we're doing it out of love. But if you talk about that, you undermine our side. What, for example? Okay, so I lived through the South African apartheid revolution. It was a successful one and it was bloody, um, but. They didn't, the ANC didn't go over why are we doing this, laboring how evil, you know, the system is, because basically everybody could see examples of it every day. They didn't have to say, we're doing this for the people, we're doing this for the land, we're doing, they just got down and said, basically, you know, we're scary bastards and, uh, you know, basically our cause is just. And and then basically just keep it business-like so that, you know, we, we, everybody knows in a quiet time over a drink while we're doing this, but we don't wear our hearts on our sleeves because we're guerrillas and we're basically fighting a war to win. And going over how, you know, how evil everybody is and how, uh, you know, how much of a, a toll we're taking emotionally and, and you know, a toll we're taking to, to the heart, uh, you say, like, you know, stiff up a lip, man. There's a job to be done, and you just put that aside, and we get business like, and then that's the way to win. That's what the ANC had to. Over many years, they got to that, and through a long trials of attrition and stuff, they got tough because they said, like, this is going to go on for a thousand years if we don't just get tough. And so they they got tough, and they they you know lost the thing. We have to we have to consensus, Gary. This is this thing that goes on and on in the left. We have to gather all the children. We have to all agree. Bullshit. (laughs) We basically need 500 guys that are effective, and that's it. Max has five minutes left, Hugh. Just a reminder. Okay. So, yeah, what what do you say to that? Because we're getting nowhere on the left. Mm -hmm. We keep on going around the same thing, saying that, you know, it's we talk about the polar bears and Naomi Klein and all of these other people say, well, they don't just, that doesn't do it for me. But who needs Naomi Klein and the middle class? We just, the, the system is so fragile and so delicate. If you look at, say, the IRA campaigns, very few people that are dedicated can actually make a difference. They don't, we don't need this huge winning the hearts and minds thing. It's like we, we just have to fight the minds of the, of the psychopaths and just speak their language. And then we'll get back to the heart afterwards when we've got a living planet. But, yeah, but I, we're I wasting totally time and resources by, by bleeding our, our emotions out all the time with the heart. And just say, like, get with the head. They fight with the head, right? Mm. 
Yeah, I think I agree to a certain extent. Um, I think the only difference that I would say is we are not seeing like that type of serious, hard headed resistance that you're talking about. We're not really seeing that around the world, you know, in isolated places, a few people here and there. But, the, you know, if we're in South Africa, the ANC doesn't exist right now, or at least the Mkanto Way Seasway, the armed wing, they don't exist yet, as far as we know. <laughs> Right. So we're a little bit further back. Uh, it's, it's in that a different, it's a, they exist. It, it's, it's in cyber war and things like that now. So, yeah, so there are a lot of people below the ground. They, you see, there, there are a lot of people that are now written off as state actors. And they, you know, the, the press writes garbage. But the, the ransomware things and stuff that you're seeing is a lot of that is um, ethical environmentalists. The yeah. other thing is that the, as the situation gets worse, if the four horsemen are riding in, uh, people take a personal toll. So you're seeing a lot of these shooters and stuff that have no framework uh, for how to resist. So they break down and they go and go postal or something like that. You, uh, that's going to happen a lot more. But you have to say, like, guys, don't do violence to yourself. Don't do violence to your coworkers. Go for the heart of the beast. So if, if you've got to the end of your tether, and it's like, go and take it out on the real beast. Don't take it out on, on innocent people and, uh, you know, soft targets that are meaningless. Is, is there are plenty of, you know, choke points in the system. So I, I think uh, it could change rapidly. The other thing is, as soon as a resistance starts, then it becomes popular. It, it becomes yeah. unpopular and popular. But as soon as people are taking radical action, then people, you'll see like, it's a, it's like a dam bursting. And, and then people go, at last, somebody's doing what I say. So yep. you can see it even on social media. If you make a risque kind of, you know, full spectrum comment, a lot of people will, will say like, well, you know, the sheep will start bleating. But there are a few wolves in there that say, yeah, it's about time. Let's do it. You know? mm -hmm. So I think that's, uh, I think, I also think that if you look at the analysis of the state, the state also sees it that way. They they thinking uh, there'll be a, a rush. Suddenly there, there'll be a, a resistance and it will be a rush. So we have to think in, in those terms more. I mean, we've gone through so many years of doing, you know, putting ourselves in bodily harm, you know, putting ourselves, doing, doing direct action that was kind of like lying in front of a digger. That hasn't really worked. It doesn't, nobody, you know, squatting in a tree or something to <laughs> stop the forest but but as soon as something effective happens armies of people will come out of the woodwork so it, it'll become a meme and that's what they're really scared of and that and in this day and age that meme can snowball very quickly yeah i think there's a lot to what you said there and um i think i would agree with most of that i think that you know you're absolutely right that Broadly speaking, nonviolent direct action has not worked. In a few cases, they protected a forest or, you know, won a campaign here and there. But you look at the global, the carbon is skyrocketing. The species extinctions are skyrocketing. Everything's headed in the wrong direction, right? So on the big scale, which is in a sense the only scale that matters um, when we're talking about a global crisis, uh, it's definitely not working. That's very clear. And I think you're right that, you know, uh, more radical action is so often um, unpopular, but also becomes very popular. You know, it's like Nelson Mandela, you know, he led the underground wing of the ANC in South Africa. A lot of people don't know that he was the leader of a military underground movement, which assassinated police officers and blew up power stations. And they were on the terrorist watch list of the United States. And now people treat him like he's this hero. Right. So you see there's sort of a whitewashing of history. And but there's also the reality that um, what is perceived as really radical at one time in retrospect is often seen as the only effective option that was possible in that situation. And I think that's absolutely going to be true for people looking back, you know, 20, 40, 100 years from now, if there's anyone still alive, is you know, if we're able to turn this stuff around, it's going to be radical action uh, that's going to, I think, play a key role in it. And I think, you know, the, the change in culture, the change in economics, all that stuff follows from, 
you know, the more radical action, in my opinion, um, you know, and, and obviously that it doesn't solve everything. Like you look at South Africa, they want, they, they toppled apartheid, but it's very much an incomplete struggle. The, the, the economic system stayed very uh, highly divided. The wealth all stayed in the hands of the same few white people, mostly. Um, a lot of the, the resistance was very upset with Mandela for um, basically compromising with in the apartheid regime was was sort of reeling so you know we have to be aware that um there's complexities here it's not it's not simple it's a complex situation and and we're going to have to navigate it there's going to be uncertainty and difficult moral questions and strategic questions um, but i think you're absolutely right that it really does come down to um this fundamental moral choice that we that we all face which is in the face of, of, you know, climate catastrophe, of the breakdown of the entire ecological system of our planet, the impact that that's going to have in terms of killing, you know, already killing millions and potentially killing billions of human beings and driving large portions of life on this planet extinct, uh, something's got to give. And it's obvious that the governments aren't going to lead that change. The corporations aren't going to lead that change. So we need to do it ourselves. And, you know, part of the way I see this work here at Thacker Pass is um, a lot of people still have faith in the system, you know. And if there are going to be more warriors on the front lines um, in, in coming years as these battles escalate, then we need to help break people of those illusions. We need to help show more and more and more that, um, that you can't depend on the government, that we can't depend on these legal systems. Um, you know, and, you know, I'm not personally, I'm not, um, I'm not a dogmatist. I think that nonviolent movements can be very effective in some cases, in some situations. I think that, uh, I also think that, you know, more violent, more confrontational forms of resistance can sometimes be very effective, but both of those can also be sometimes be very ineffective. <laughs> and, uh, and I think that we need to, uh, really keep our eyes on the prize and think critically. And, you know, this, these type of conversations are really important. So I'm, I'm, I'm really grateful for y'all for having me on and, look forward to checking out hopefully this will spark some good discussions and commentary among among folks who watch well it's so nice to speak to you it's yeah, um okay. i'm so thank glad you. to catch up and thank you yeah. thank you so much for bright green lies and to all, oh, yeah. all that you, you're doing so great, great. give them hell up there give them hell <laughs> yeah we will great, great work good luck for the camp good luck. yeah thank you very much thank you max we might talk yeah. again someday yeah okay. i'd be happy to join you anytime Good. Yeah, I would love to talk to you again. Let's try and do that. Okay. Take good care. All right. Take care. You too. Take Bye. care. Bye for now. I'll stop recording. I've forgotten that. Oh, yeah. <laughs>